Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Sabrina Hartuno, and I'm one of your three Athenaeum Fellows for this year. One of the key issues at the forefront of the 2020 presidential campaign is the topic of health care. Almost every Democrat running for president wants a system that provides affordable and quality universal health care that ensures the 27 million Americans still living without coverage. But how to achieve that goal is dividing the Democratic Party. Medicare for All, the single-payer fin financing system championed by Bernie Sanders, would eliminate private insurers as well as premiums and deductibles and other forms of payments. Our speaker tonight will discuss the long-term repercussions of such a system and propose instead a market-based alternative to, al uh, to affordable health care. Sally Pipes, President, CEO, and Thomas W. S Smith Fellow in Healthcare Policy at the Pacific Research Institute, is an expert on healthcare and healthcare reform. A regular commentator on the shortcomings of Medicare for All, Pipes writes a bi-weekly healthcare column for Forbes.com and for the Washington Examiner's blog, blog Beltway Confidential. In 2018 alone, she published over 300 healthcare op-eds, many of which were reprinted and, retw and retweeted. Pipes has been invited to many high-level discussions and debates about healthcare reform, where she argues against single-payer type of systems. Pipes served as one of Mayor Rudy's will four healthcare advisors in his bid for the Republican nomination for president in 2008. Author of several books on health care, Encounter Books will publish her next book, False Premise, False Promise, the, des the, the Disastrous Reality of Medicare for All in Early 2020. Pipes serves on multiple boards, including BRI, a Federalist Society Society type organization for medical students across America, which she founded in 2008. Ms. Pipes' Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored with funding from the Open Academy at CMC. As always, I must remind you to please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time and adjust your seats if you had not already done so. I must also remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. And now, please join me in welcoming Sally Pipes to the Athenaeum. And um, just so you know, my new book, uh, false premise, false promise. It was out in January, so it was number one on the Amazon Health Law Books um, just a couple of weeks ago. So, so we're although I don't, I'm not paid royalties. I, it's still exciting to see that it's up near the top there. Um, I would like to thank uh, Priya Junar and also Mark Blitz, who's on his way to South Carolina. I understand uh, for inviting me to speak this evening at the Athenaeum. I think it was probably, ooh, I don't know, 10 years ago when I spoke here. I think Obamacare was sort of just starting, and Obamacare will be 10 on March 23rd. So time flies when we're having so much fun. <laughs> and thank you all for coming out tonight. A good, it looks like a very good group. Um, I know that many of you are were probably interested in what's happening in New Hampshire. Um, but um, I guess you'll have to put your phones away and you'll have to wait till it's over. But when, when I arrived, it looked like Bernie Sanders was in first place, followed um, uh, by uh, Pete Buttigieg. Um, Mr. Biden is down at the bottom, number five, and so I guess he left for South Carolina. Um, and then um, uh, Amy Klobuchar was rising, and so things are, things are happening. But it is interesting that in the exit polling, health care polled as the number one issue in the people in New Hampshire. 35% said health care is the biggest issue in our country, followed by climate change. 70% uh, of the people in the exit poll said they supported single payer and 30% did not. So it's going to be interesting. But um, anyway, thank you all for coming. I really believe, as I say, single payer will be the, the, the biggest domestic policy issue in this November's election. My remarks this evening are going to focus on the false promise of single payer health care. I'm going to highlight the problems with systems uh, such as the Canadian health care system and the system in the United Kingdom, the National Health Service, which is a, um, a universal coverage system because they have private care and um, government care. And I'm going to conclude my remarks with a market-based plan based on competition and choice because I believe those are the ways that we will achieve universal coverage for all Americans. What I like to say is understanding health care is similar to unraveling an onion many layers and many tearful moments. 
I know many of you uh, are men here and you probably don't cut up a lot of onions, but if you do chop onions like I do, they cause many tearful moments. With a few exceptions, many politicians do not really feel comfortable talking about the issue because there's no question it is a complicated issue. Nonetheless, as I say, I do believe it will remain at the top of the um, issues in this upcoming election. In the January Gallup poll, it showed that 35% of Americans polled think candidates' positions on health care are extremely important. With the exception of a few so-called um, uh, so moderate Democrats who want to build on Obamacare, the law that I just said came into being March 23rd, 2010, the focus is among Democrats on to moving to a single-payer uh, health care or a stepping stone approach to single payer, i.e. the public option, which would be a government insurance plan that would compete against private insurers uh, in the market. But it is noteworthy, I just want to say that the uh, Medicare for All single payer is gaining support among doctors. And I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal yesterday um, on, on that very issue. Medicare for All could mean doctors for none. At the 2019 annual meeting of the American uh, Medical Association, and I want people, a lot of people in America think the AMA represents all doctors. In fact, it only represents 20% of doctors in this country. But at the annual meeting in Chicago last June, the membership voted on a resolution to support Medicare for All, and it was the closest vote ever, 53% against the, the um, initiative and 47% for. Bob Doherty, who is the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at the American College of Physicians, tweeted right after that meeting that the strong showing for single payer um, for, would, would have been unimaginable five years ago. And of course, Bernie Sanders brought this to the fore, really, in 2016 when he was running against Hillary for the nomination. On January 20th of this year, the American College of Physicians, that same group, representing 159,000 internists officially endorsed single-payer health care. And Senator Sanders said he was very delighted with the support. I wanted to just mention a couple of things that are in my uh, uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed. U.S. physicians last year, 2019, earned on average $313,000 a year, while the average physician in the U.K. in the same category earned 138,000, less than half. American primary care doctors, of which we do have a shortage of, earned on average $218,000 in 2016, the latest year for which we have stats, while their counterparts in Canada, where I'm from, 146,000, and in the UK, 134,000. So those are things to, to keep in mind when you're thinking about the issue. Single payer or Medicare for all, what does that mean? It means there would be no private insurance coverage allowed. Everybody would be in a government-run plan, and it, the government would cover everything considered what we call medically necessary. This is what Bernie Sanders, who I call the Pied Piper of single-payer health plan, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who has recently softened her approach to single-payer and is moving to the public option, but she did say within year three of her presidency she would move right to single payer. And of course, House member and chairman of the Medicare for All Caucus up in Washington State, Pramila Jayapal, she too is aggressively calling for single payer. The, um, if you look in the U.S., what are the polls, what is the support for single payer? In the January Kaiser Family Foundation poll, um, it showed that significantly more people now support that public option, that government insurance plan to compete against private insurers. And they show that 68% of people polled support the public option, while as 56% support Medicare for all. And that's up from 53% uh, last November. So there is support. However, you need to think about when people are polled and asked, 180 million Americans have their health care through their employment. 71% of those people polled rate their health care as good or as excellent. When those people were polled and asked, well, what do you think if it means you're going to lose your private insurance? Support went down to 37%. When asked, the same group was asked, well, what do you think 
if, if taxes are going to have to be increased significantly to pay for this type of a plan, support also dropped to 37 percent. Bernie Sanders, of course, continues his um, nonstop campaign for the Democratic nomination. As of earlier, he was number one uh, in the New Hampshire uh, poll, and we'll know more later tonight. But, you know, he suffered a heart problem when he was campaigning last fall in, in Las Vegas. And he had emergency angioplasty heart surgery to repair a blocked artery. He received immediate, private, and first-class treatment. In the United States, two-thirds of patients who needed an emergency angioplasty test got it within 24 hours. If Sanders' heart issue had happened in Canada, where I'm from, with its single-payer system, all private coverage outlawed, he should note that no one receives care within 24 hours, and nearly two-thirds have to wait more than three days, while the average wait for angioplasty is three to 11 weeks. How much would the single-payer system cost in this country? Charles Blayhouse, an economist at the Mercatus Center, released an analysis of, his, um, of, of, San of Bernie Sanders' plans. He showed that the projected increase in federal spending would be between 30 to $40 trillion over 10 years. After accounting for any possible savings in administrative costs and lower drug costs, the total cost of the health care system under single payer would be somewhere between 54 and $60 trillion over 10 years. And those estimates were matched by the Urban Institute, which is a more liberal think tank, and the RAND Corporation, which is kind of in the middle. We do spend a lot on health care in this country. We spend about $3.5 trillion a year, 18% of our GDP. America is a wealthy country, and Americans demand the very best in health care, and they don't want to have to wait. My mom, um, who I'll talk about a bit later, but back in Vancouver, um, she was worried that I was becoming increasingly American, that I might become a Canadian, I mean American, which I did um, after she passed away. But she said, I hope you're not becoming one of those aggressive Americans. But you know, Americans are, are impatient, and they don't want to have to wait. So Charles Blayhouse showed that if all corporate income taxes and all personal income taxes were doubled to pay for single payer, it wouldn't be enough. The only way we can bring down the cost of health care under single payer would be to reduce the amount of money that doctors are paid. Under Bernie Sanders' plan, Elizabeth Warren's uh, original single payer plan, doctors would be paid 40% below what they're paid today. Doctors' salaries would be tied to what doctors get um, paid for treating uh, patients who are on Medicare. And my own OBGYN who retired at the end of January, he said, I just can't take all the paperwork, all the essential benefits, all of the mandates. And he said, I lose so much money on treating uh, Medicaid patients in California Medi-Cal. I hardly break even on my Medicare patients. So I have to make my salary through treating people with private coverage. So as I'm saying, the Sanders plan and the, and the Warren plan, all of these plans, the stepping stone approach, all would have to cut do what doctors are paid um, in order to um, cover part of the system. In an interview on January 25th with uh, CBS's Nor Nora O'Donnell, Bernie Sanders, who had admitted that his plan would cost 30 to $40 trillion over 10 years, he said, I don't know how much my health care plans are going to cost. And Nora O'Donnell said, you mean you are recommending a program for all Americans and you don't know what the cost will be. But he did say his plan would be paid for by several uh, major tax increases. There would be a new 4% income tax on anyone earning $29,000 or more, a new 7.5% payroll tax, new marginal tax rates on the wealthy, a 77% estate tax, and a new tax on all large financial institutions. Sanders and others do not account for the fact that government would have to set a global budget on what it is willing to spend on health care. Because as all economists have said, the demand for something that is considered free, demand will be much greater than the supply. So the demand for health care would soar when people deem it free, supply will be limited, and the result will be, just like in Canada and the UK, long waits for care and ration care. MIT economist who I admire, Amy Finkelstein, says there is an enormous amount of evidence 
that leaves no doubt in any sensible person's mind that getting rid of cost-sharing provisions in health care will increase demand for and the use of health care. As Milton Friedman, when he talked about employer-sponsored coverage and how much it was costing, he said, people use a lot of health care when they have employer coverage because first, it's all first dollar coverage and people have no idea what the real cost is. Even New York Times columnist Paul Krugman, who I've debated at Intelligence Squared in New York, um, has said, it is clear that Sanders is using Canadian health care as a political pawn to advance his own agenda. By supporting a single payer health care system, he is simply appealing to voters with unrealistic promises. When I debated um, um, Paul Krugman at this debate in New York, and I was talking about the Canadian health care system, and he interrupted John Donvan from ABC News and said he wanted to ask the audience a question. This was at Rockefeller University, and there were about 400 people in the audience. So he said, how many people in the audience are Canadian? And about 10 people put up their hand. And then he said, well, how many of you like the Canadian system? Not one person put up their hand. And he sort of, being a, Paul Krugman is kind of a troll. He looks like he lives and could live under a bridge. He never, he never cracks a smile, and he just sort of went back to his seat. But I think this, was, this is very telling. The American people need to understand what it means when government is a sole provider of health care. Now, I've mentioned the hypothetical plans of Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. He is for a public option, the government, plan, the government insurance plan. But he said, if we can't get universal coverage, I then, too, would go for a single-payer system. He said his plan would cost about $1.5 trillion over 10 years. Joe Biden said his plan would cost $750 billion over 10 years. These are all numbers that none of us can relate to because we don't make that kind of money. We're not in the hedge fund business. But they're very high numbers. So I've talked about the hypothetical plans by several Democratic candidates and what those plans would mean for our health care. I now want to focus on the results from two countries that actually have such systems. Canada, the Canadian government fully took over the health care system in 1984 under the Canada Health Act, bringing true single-payer coverage to the entire country. Doctors work for themselves in Canada, but their payer is the provincial government. There's no private coverage. They also are paid, you're paid the same. If I'm the very best ophthalmologist, and my husband Charles Kessler's the worst, um, we both get paid the same. There's no difference in how much you're paid, so they don't um, support uh, merit. They also face global budgets set by the province. So my cousin, who's an ophthalmologist, his global budget for doing cataract surgery usually ends in mid to late November. So David can't get paid for any more surgeries, and so, he has to shut down his, his practice. Canada has one of the most expensive single-payer healthcare systems in the developed world, but there's an imbalance between the value that Canadians receive and the relatively high amount of money they spend on their system. In Canada, the average ta uh, family pays in hidden taxes, taxes that they don't pay at the, at the store when you go to the doctor, $13,311 a year. If you saw Bernie Sanders on Fox News Sunday, he said it was appalling that the American people on average were paying $11,000 a year for their health care. In Canada, it's free. It's not free. Canadians are paying more for their health care on average than people in America. The Canadian government sets a global budget. They spend 11.2% of GDP compared to our um, 18%. But the demand for health care is much greater than the government is willing to pay for. What are the results? long waiting lists for care, ration care, high taxes, and a shortage of doctors. In 2019 at the Fraser Institute, where I started my career as an economist, according to their latest survey, the average waiting time in 2019 from seeing a primary care doctor to getting treatment by a specialist, 20.9 weeks. That's over five months. That is up from the 9.3 weeks back in 1993. This wait time was the longest time ever recorded in Canada for weights. The average wait for an MRI is 11 weeks, for neurosurgery, 33 weeks. Last year, 608,000 Canadians out of a population of 37 million, fewer than in the state of California, 
left Canada and came to the United States and paid out of pocket for treatments, at MRIs, CT scans, heart surgeries, hip replacements, because they felt that the waiting time on the list was, was too long. And if you think um, about it, I just read in the paper today in Saskatchewan, where the, uh, the takeover of the Canadian healthcare system started by uh, then Premier Tommy Douglas, Saskatchewan has just made an appeal to the federal government to see if they could let some private MRI clinics open up because, and have people pay because the waiting times are so long and harmful to one's health, particularly if you think you have you know, something serious like a cancer or, or something along that line. And waiting times in Canada are particularly problematic for the elderly. More than two million Canadians aged 55 and over reported significant barriers when accessing the healthcare system. One third of elderly patients in Canada waited more than six months for surgery, while close to 25% waited that long to see a specialist. Meanwhile, also in Canada, there are scores of empty operating rooms sitting idle every night across the country. And they have, Canada is a country that loves to train orthopedic surgeons, but they can't hire them because the provincial government doesn't have the money to pay for them. Uh, my niece who graduated um, th uh, five years ago as an orthopedic surgeon in Winnipeg, she waited three years to get a job as an orthopedic surgeon. She finally uh, got one because she found in Ontario she, could, she found a job that she could get paid. But not one of her graduates from University of, of um, Manitoba were able to find jobs before a three-year waiting time. Wait times also pose real costs on patients because you have pain, you have suffering, you have mental anguish, worrying what might be wrong with you, and in many cases, loss of wages. Preventable illnesses can turn into chronic conditions, irreversible conditions, or even permanent disabilities if they're not taken care of. My own mother, who died from colon cancer as a senior um, in Vancouver, she couldn't get a colonoscopy. When she thought she had colon cancer, she went to her general practitioner. You can't, you can't see a specialist without getting a referral. She went to her GP and he took an, had an x-ray taken of her colon. For those of you in the medical field, you don't detect colon cancer with an x-ray. It's discovered with a colonoscopy. So she went back to her doctor and said, my daughter says that I need a colonoscopy. And the doctor said, I'm sorry, but you won't be able to get a colonoscopy because there are too many, you're a senior, there are too many younger people with conditions who are on the waiting list. My mother got her colonoscopy six months later when she started to hemorrhage. She went to the hospital in an ambulance, two days in the emergency room, two days in the transit lounge at Vancouver General Hospital, one of the largest hospitals in Canada, waiting uh, to get a bed in a ward. She did get her colonoscopy, but my mom died from metastasized colon cancer two weeks later. If you ration care, you can control costs, but it's not the kind of healthcare system that we want. Michael Bublé, the Canadian crooner, and I love his Christmas album. I make Charles play it all the time. When his son, Noah, age three, was diagnosed in Vancouver with liver cancer, he didn't wait to go to the BC Cancer Control Agency. He came down to Los Angeles, to Children's Hospital of, um, of Los Angeles. He paid out of pocket, and he could afford to pay, but he had, as he said, the very best specialist, the very best care, and today his son is cancer-free. He had an opportunity to go to the best. Where would we as Americans go if we have a system where the government is totally determining what kind of health care we are going to get? The combination of relatively high spending and comparatively poor performance should be a warning to all of us in America. As Madam Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin of the Canadian Supreme Court, who just retired, she said in a 2005 ruling which said we should be able to have some private coverage in this country. Access to a waiting list is not access to health care. Having a care card, remember Hillary held up that health security card? Having a care card does not mean you can get a doctor. In the UK, my other example, Britain has a universal coverage system. It's called the National Health Service. It turned 71 years old on, in July of 2019. It allows private coverage in the UK and about 20% of patients have private coverage. When the Canadian politicians went to England to see what was about the National Health Service, they asked the, the doctors in Britain, what was the biggest mistake you ever made? 
they said, allowing private coverage to run parallel to the government system. The British system has been in financial distress ever since it was implemented. Massive sums are spent on the, on the service, and yet the NHS continues to fail patients with long waiting lists and ration care as well. Yet it is treated as a sacred institution, thereby making it immune from criticism. As Nigel Lawson, former Chancellor of the Exchequer to British Prime Minister uh, Margaret Thatcher said, the NHS is the nearest thing to a religion that we have. A writer in The Guardian a few weeks ago reported that the NHS is the world's best healthcare system. The only serious black mark against the NHS was its poor record on keeping people alive. The NHS is under strain with a shortage of 100,000 providers. That means doctors, nurses, and people that work in, in hospitals. Even offering financial incentives to doctors abroad who'd gone abroad and left Britain, they couldn't get, they could hardly get any to come back to the UK. Brits have a higher risk of dying from cancer compared to other nations. It has been five years since the National Health Care, National Health Service cancer treatment target was met. The key cancer target was missed for more than 1,000 days. Hospitals are supposed to start treatment within 62 days of getting a referral from a general practitioner. The results of a new survey from the World Health Organization that were reported in the medical journal Lancet Oncology said Britain is at the bottom of the international league tables on five-year cancer survival rates and is lagging 20 years behind some countries for certain types of cancer. A 2019 report released by the British government on the downsides of a single-payer system. The study reports historic waiting lists, over 4.4 million Brits, up to 40% um, 40 in five years, are waiting for, for treatment with specialists. And 850,000 patients waited more than four hours to be admitted to a hospital after a decision was made that the ambulance is there and they should be accepted a 759% increase in trolley weights, as they're called, since 2011. A front page story in the Sunday Times of January 5th reported that 11.3 million patients waited more than three weeks to see a GP, and of those, 5.6 million waited more than a month. As the head of the Royal College of GPs said, these waits are totally unacceptable. Patients deserve better. In December, Patients in the UK were seeing, on average, 70 patients a day. My, my best friend's husband was a GP in Canada. He retired at age 40 because he couldn't get, he was seeing 65 patients a day. He couldn't get the tests that he wanted for his patients, and so he just retired early. His son went to medical school in the US and is an orthopedic surgeon uh, now, and he is very worried what might happen to the American healthcare system. National Health Service Investigations has warned Patients are going blind as they have to wait too long for, to get an appointment with an eye specialist. These delays are having a devastating impact on patients. A review by the NHS found 4,500 glaucoma patients, you're all way too young to get glaucoma, but it's a concern to me, had been delayed at the trust. And 16% of those people went blind because they could not get uh, timely uh, care. Chief hospital inspector in the UK Ted Baker warned of the normalization of wholly unsatisfactory treatment that endangers patients and the inability to guard against unacceptable and unsafe practices of putting, piling patients in corridors that lack staffing for, sub, for um, sufficient oversight. Mr. Baker, a professor, described the NHS as a relic in urgent need of transformation that was overwhelmed and is only going to get worse. It's no wonder that Rolling Stone frontman Mick Jagger, age 75, when he was diagnosed with needing a heart valve replacement, and he's a Brit, he didn't go back to Britain. He went to New York, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital and had his heart valve replacement done there. He didn't go to the UK. And his younger brother Chris, age 71, said, at least Mick has not got to wait in line for the National Health Service. There is no question that single payer or Medicare for all is no longer a pie in the sky idea in the US. 
Democrats like Senator Sanders, Warren, uh, Buttigieg, they're telling the American people that health care is a right. It is not a right. We have right, a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Declaring a right to health care would mean an unlimited demand for health care, but this would not miraculously provide the uh, unlimited supply to meet that demand. What would that right entail? I mean, I think it's more important if we have to have a right, we have a right to food. If we can't have food, we can't live. But does it mean the right to top-notch care? Or does it mean the right to equal care? Would the government have the, to ban people from purchasing private coverage or paying for better care, as is the case in Canada? Would the government have the right to tell me to keep myself healthy? Do I waive the right if I'm a smoker or I'm obese? In the UK, if you are a smoker or you are obese, the NHS denies care to certain, for certain treatments if you're a smoker or you are obese. Single payer today, though, cannot become the law of the land. As I said, it is the number one issue in this upcoming election. But the Democrats would have to win the presidency, they'd have to take back the Senate, and they'd have to hold the House. Because of this massive support, though, for M4, uh, Medicare for All, uh, the time is now, from my point of view, to educate Americans on what it would mean if the government took over our whole health care system immediately, as Senator Sanders said, he would introduce single-payer health care within the first week of his presidency. Senator Warren said she would introduce in the first 100 days her public option, and in year three, she would introduce single-payer because she said everyone would love it so much, the public government insurance, that they would want single-payer. But I do think I want to talk just briefly about some of the ideas that are out there. I believe that we can achieve universal coverage in this country if we offer universal choice. America is a country that offers choice in so many of our areas. We don't have a free market in healthcare in this country today. 50% of our healthcare is already in the hands of government through Medicare, the program for our seniors, Medicaid, the program for people earning below 138% of the federal poverty level, the CHIP program for children, and the Veterans Administration. The VA is an example. It is a single-payer system, and if you read the mainstream media, you'll see the long waits for care that our vets are facing, uh, vets dying, not being able to get access to care, not having access to the latest drugs because they're not on the formal area of the VA. So I think we need to really look at what does it mean when the government runs the health care system, and the VA is an example. Under Bernie Sanders' plan of Medicare for All, there would be the government plan. The only two other plans that would be allowed would be the Indian Health Services Plan and the Veterans Administration. The cure for um, reforming our health care system lies in giving Americans choices in the type of health care that they want and that suits their needs and those of their families. So in my plan to reform health care, to achieve, as I say, universal coverage through universal choice, we should change the tax code. We got into this mess during World War II when wage and price controls were, um, were, were implemented by the government. Everyone in this room, of course, was not alive uh, during World War II, but the government gave employers the right under wage and price controls to, to um, give their employees health care, um, which would be tax-free. Then. Um, but the problem is, so we have 180 million Americans who have employer-sponsored coverage. But if you lose your job or you quit your job, you have to go into the individual market or the exchange market, and you have to buy your health care with after-tax dollars. So I would like to get rid of this employer-sponsored um, health insurance, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. But I would like to see things change so that individuals could buy their health coverage and get it tax-free as well. We need to expand health savings accounts. I know CMC offers HSAs for um, employers and em uh, for professors and employees, but we should increase the amount of money that people can put in their health savings account each year, and they should be able to carry it forward uh, year to year without paying tax on it. And um, we now have about 21 million Americans have health savings account. They put the doctor and the patient in charge of their health care. When we're in charge of making our own decisions, we will have a more efficient system. We should allow people to use their health savings accounts to pay part of their premium. Right now, you can't do that. For people who are having trouble paying their premium, they should be able to use their HSA if they have one. 
We should allow people who are on Medicare, the Warren Buffetts of the world, who are very wealthy, he should be able to have a health savings account. Medicare should be there for our seniors who don't have the ability to um, purchase health, to purchase their own health care. And under Medicare, we now have about 60 million Americans are on Medicare. And one in three new Medicare eligibles is unable to find a doctor because, as I mentioned, docs are paid 40% below. So 35% of people that are on Medicare are now buying Medicare Advantage plans or Medicare Supplemental plans in order so that they can get a doctor and the, what they have done can be, can be paid for. We need to get rid of the CON laws, that Certificate of Need laws. Hospitals um, have these Certificate of Need laws in most states. And it means that if I want to set up a private cancer hospital down the road here, I would have to get approval from all the other hospitals in this area before I would be able to start my own hospital. This keeps competition out of the marketplace. I also like to um, support um, the establishment of retail clinics. CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, people with minor conditions can go to a CVS and get treatment for a cold or a sore throat. You don't necessarily have to go to a medical doctor, but a nurse practitioner can be very helpful. We need to raise the age of, med of eligibility for Medicare. When Medicare came into being in 1965 under President Lyndon Johnson's Great Society Plan, Medicaid came in at the same time, uh, the average American lived to age 65. Today, the average American lives to age 79. And so there's tremendous pressure on the Medicare system, which is costing about $600 billion a year. And the uh, Medicare trustees have said Part B will be bankrupt by 2030 at a cost of $1 trillion. We need to um, reform Medicaid through block grants to the states so that those eligible for Medicaid, people earning below 138% of the federal poverty level, could actually buy HMO type plans so that they would have control over, over their health care. Individuals should be able to purchase their coverage and as long as they keep renewing that coverage, as they get older we will get conditions as we get older. But if they keep up their coverage, premiums should be held um, at reasonable rates and this is one of the solutions I have for people with pre-existing conditions. People, young people buy their coverage, keep it up to date and then as they get older then the premiums will go up slightly, not massively. The other thing on um, pre-existing conditions, the, about the, in the election in 2018, the Democrats said there were 120 million Americans with pre-existing conditions. Well, most of those people with pre-existing conditions are in the employer market. There are only six million people in the individual market who have pre-existing conditions. These are the people that we need to take care of. And my idea is for the federal government to give grants to each of the states to set up a high-risk pool so that those people with chronic conditions can get affordable coverage and good coverage. One of the problems with Obamacare was they thought that all the people, the young people, were going to buy um, plans on the exchanges so that they could then subsidize the older people who had conditions. And they thought 26% of young people would, would buy coverage. Very few bought it. They paid that individual mandate. So young people are paying on average in 2019 over $300 a month for individual coverage um, because they were having to subsidize people who are older with um, um, chronic conditions. Medical malpractice reform is needed. Doctors practice defensive medicine because they are afraid of being sued. PricewaterhouseCoopers put that number at $210 billion a year. We need to cap non-economic damages and we need to cap punitive damages. They did this at 500,000 um, in Texas and 16,000 new doctors went into the state of Texas. So those are a few of the ideas that I have that would allow us to achieve universal coverage by universal choice. If I want a plan that has um, alcohol rehabilitation because my work is very stressful, I should be able to get it. But you shouldn't have to buy a plan. You might want a plan that has um, hair prostheses or um, in vitro fertilization, but I shouldn't, you, I shouldn't have to subsidize you, you shouldn't have to subsidize me. People should be able to get the kind of plan that suits uh, their, their needs. I hope that some of you will read my new book, False Premise, False Promise, The Disastrous Reality of Medicare for All. In this country, to achieve universal coverage, we need choice and competition. That is the way we are going to achieve the goal that we all have, affordable, accessible, quality care. As my friend P.J. O'Rourke says, if you think healthcare is expensive now, 
Just wait until it's free. Thank you. We now have some time for questions. Please raise your hand and Zenaida or I will come to you with the microphone. When asking your questions, please remember to stand up and try to keep them brief. As always, priority will go to students. Hello, thank you so much for coming to give oh, your talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering how a recent study that came out uh, between Harvard and Princeton that showed 94% uh, of all jobs created between 2005 and 2015 were non-traditional gig economy jobs. Right. How that would affect your health savings account plan and the subsequent high-risk pool of people who can't have access to employment-tied HSAs. Well, I mean, right now, as many of you probably know, in California we have AB5, which um, has um, eliminated um, in independent contractors in most Field. So if you're a, a Uber driver, a Lyft driver, if you're a, a journalist who works on his own, you of course now have to become um, an employee of a company or set up your own company, which is really um, a disaster because a lot of the people that drive for Uber, that, that work you know, as, as um, um, writers for newspapers and things, they're part of the gig economy. They're, they're individuals, they wanna be their own private bosses, but under this new law that the governor signed in January, it's. It, it, it's just not going to be possible um, in, in the state of California. And of course, other states will probably copy what we do because everything that, it used to be that California was the golden state and everybody you know, followed all the great ideas, but things are changing on that. So I would say you know, th there wouldn't be health savings accounts. There wouldn't be private insurers. And if you're in the gig economy, you would be part of the government health care plan just like everyone else. So it would be, it would be um, government takeover and you wouldn't be able to choose what is the type of plan that suits your needs as an individual. I mean, I meet, I, I don't have a car, so I Uber, all, I even Ubered out here. And um, it's, it's cheaper for me to take a $30 Uber than to own a car and pay maintenance and the cost of everything. But people, people, many of the people that I talk to that are Uber drivers, you know, the man today, you know, he likes to play tennis, he's sort of retired, his wife still works, so he makes extra money doing this. People should be able to make their own decisions, and that's why the gig economy is so big in this country. But it's going to be interesting to see, because certain people in government want to shut down that, the opportunity that many of us have. Thank you for your talk today. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons why I support single-payer healthcare was because, I guess, when I read articles about the inequalities of our current system and the kind of unequal treatments that people get under the current system, I guess it, it's as heartening to me as hearing to the different cases that you mentioned today under the, the inefficiencies that would lead to different tragic cases under the single payer healthcare system. So it was helpful to hear you point out the different ways that um, the gap between demand and supply within a single payer healthcare system would lead to um, inefficiency that would be equally tra tragic. Um, and it was also really helpful to hear about the different reforms that you had in mind to kind of um, s figure out how to get to a place where we could get universal care, uh, universal coverage. Right. I was wondering if you could speak more about a concern I have, which is the inequality in healthcare that we currently have, and if you could speak to more about the kind of reforms that you see as practical and also addressing and kind of narrowing the gap in the inequalities in our current system? Right, well, um, there, I mean, there are inequalities in all aspects of our lives. The idea that government would be able to get rid of all that inequality, if government took over our healthcare system, as I pointed out, it will bring down the quality of care for everyone. As Madam Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin said, you know, access uh, to, um, access to um, healthcare um, doesn't mean you're going to get the very best of health care. So everybody would be brought down. But of course, I mean, if you look in Canada, uh, Danny Williams, the uh, former premier of Newfoundland, when he was diagnosed with a heart valve problem and he was told that he couldn't get um, the surgery in Newfoundland or in Quebec and the, or in Ontario, and if they could, the wait would be too long. And Danny Williams flew to Miami to Mount Sinai Hospital and paid for his 
um, heart valve replacement, he came back and the Canadian media said, how can you go to the evil United States? And Daddy Williams said, it's my heart, it's my health, it's my choice. We want to have choice in healthcare. If government runs everything, I mean, if you take a look, I don't know if any, how many of you drive, but I just had to go to the DMV uh, to renew my license and get my ID card. After waiting for two months trying to get an appointment, I realized that my license would expire before I got the appointment. There was, there was a woman standing in the line at the post office, um, and everybody was, there was one wicket open. There were all these people milling around the post office behind and no, not waiting on anybody. And this woman stepped out of the line and said, if you think that this is frustrating for you when you're trying to get stamps or mail your package, this is what it'll be like under single payer. Everybody, you know, will be waiting. But people that have, you know, more um, stature that will, even under a government-run system, like Danny Williams went to um, Miami, Robert Bourassa, the Premier of Quebec, when he was diagnosed in Montreal with multiple myelo uh, melanoma, you know, he wasn't confident that he would be able to get good care in Canada, and he went to, um, to um, Washington, D.C., and had his surgery done there. Peep, you know, this inequality thing, we're talking about inequality, gaining quality by bringing everyone down to a level where it will be equal care, but it won't be good care. Hi. Um, I would just like to return to a quote that you said, which is, demand will soar when health care is free. Um, so as you may know, there are thousands of people in the Appalachia area, the United States, an area that I was raised very close by to, who are underinsured or uninsured. Many of these people have chronic illnesses, decaying teeth, access, no access to health care at all, malnutrition, and have no ability to access basic care. As no person in the United States should be forced into poverty by illness, and no person in the year 2020 should die from a toothache, how do you propose, at, um, to, how do you propose to adequately address these people in the Appalachia area who work two to three jobs and still have no ability to access any type of care in their daily lives? Well, first of all, no one in America can be denied health care. Anyone in America can turn up at an emergency room or a community hospital and they have to be treated. That is federal law and that's the way it is. The second thing is, that anyone who is b earning below 138% of the poverty, uh, federal poverty level, an income of about $22,000 is eligible for Medicaid. And a lot of these people that are eligible for Medicaid haven't signed up. We also, you know, there's a reason that if you're a highly trained specialist, you don't want to go to a small town. In Canada, a few years ago, they tried to say that, that when docs graduated, they were determining where they were going to have to go and practice medicine. Well, the specialists were furious that they were being sent to these small, out-of-the-way places where they didn't even have the, the latest equipment in order to do the kinds of surgeries that they were, they were trained for. So we, if we open up the system and have all kinds of different types of care, and if we have you know, high-risk pools for people who live in, whether it's Appalachia or upstate New York or wherever, they are going to be able to get care. But when you hear you know, someone like Bernie Sanders say 44,000 Americans died because they didn't have um, health coverage. 44,000 people in Canada die every year, and it's a much um, larger percentage of the population because they can't get access to care. My, my best friend, her husband, just died on Sunday from colon cancer. He, his father was head of the heart team at VGH. He did the first heart transplant operation probably 40, 40 years ago. And yet, when the government took over the health care system, everything became difficult, and he thought that he might have health, um, uh, something, a colon problem. And he finally got an appointment with a GP. He had a stool test, this awful thing to talk about at dinner, but he never heard back. And so finally, when he was really quite ill, he called the cancer agency and they said, oh, we lost so many people's um, stool tests. And so he went back for another one and had stage four colon cancer. And he just, he lived, that was in, in May, and he just passed away. And so, you know, I mean, we, we have the very best people in, in this country go into medicine. If we're going to start paying doctors as government employees making 40% less than they're making today, I can tell you that the best and brightest kids are not going to go um, into medicine. If you look at the um, number, 27 million people, you'll hear 27 million people in this country are uninsured. Well, the U.S. Census Bureau that tracks all of this stuff said 27.4 million people, non-elderly, were uninsured in 2017. 
6.8 million, 27%, 25%, were eligible for Medicaid or the CHIP program, and they didn't enroll in it. 8.2 million, 30%, were eligible for Obamacare subsidies, but did not enroll on the exchanges. 85% of the people on the Obamacare exchanges received subsidies, so their, their insurance was about $100 a month. 3.8 million of them, 14%, declined the offer of employer-sponsored coverage. Well, only 1.9 million were not eligible for subsidies because their income was above 400% of the federal poverty level. Here in California, that, uh, uh, Gavin Newsom just raised that uh, percentage to 600% of the FPL. And so at 4.1 million, were ineligible for subsidies as they were illegal immigrants, they weren't Americans. So you have to really look behind the numbers when you're talking about what kind of care people are getting. A lot of people decide not to take advantage of the system, but we certainly know that in, in places, nobody can be denied coverage in this country or care. And even Michelle Obama, when um, um, Barack was talking about um, his um, Obamacare, she was a vice president at the University of Chicago working in the medical in the medical, um, in the medical, in the hospital. And she said publicly that people that are, you know, have sore throats, they're, they're, they have minor conditions, they're turning up at the University of Chicago emergency room. This is the most expensive care uh, in the country. These people should be turning up at the community hospital and they can get good care. The University of Chicago emergency room should be there for people, you know, have had a heart attack, they've had a stroke and things. So we have to, that's why I really think we really need to have different types of, 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 of coverage, different types of health care, that will, because that what make, is what makes America great. And I was speaking a couple of Saturdays ago at, ago, at, ago at a Health Innovation 2040 conference. All the people there, 200 uh, MBA grads and gra MBA students, and they all had so many wonderful ideas of how to open up the health care economy. Why is it that there aren't many more new insurers in the market? There should be much more competition in the health insurance market. There isn't because there are so many demands and mandates and regulations. Obamacare brought 10 essential health benefits to any insurance plan, adding 20 to 50% to the cost of a premium. Most states have 45 to 50 state mandates. So what person in their right mind would want to you know, start an insurance company? There's no incentive to do it. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just want to continue to hone in on the question of the underinsured, not the uninsured. Right. Um, the example that I'm thinking of particularly is for people with complex cancer cases. Uh, yes. Multiple studies have shown that for people with complex cancer cases, about 46% of people will go bankrupt in two years. Right. Most situations, they are forced to declare bankruptcy as a way of getting those publicly mandated healthcare assets so that they can afford their complex care coverage. I, uh, if I need a chemotherapy infusion, I cannot show up at an emergency room and ask for one. So for those people who are dealing with complex cancer ca cases or anything of that sort, um, under your system, how does it help those people? Right. And there's a lot of misconception about medical bankruptcy in this country, and Bernie Sanders' numbers have been broken down because a lot of the people that sh said they went bankrupt uh, because of medical issues, when their bills were analyzed, they had large credit card debts, they had mortgage debts, and that the actual health care debt was a small portion of why they went bankrupt. I'm actually starting to do research on this to, to find out more about it because it's, you know, we, we don't want to perpetuate a, a myth that isn't, uh, isn't correct. Um, so, in, in, the, in the states, um, as I say, 180 million Americans over half have um, employer-sponsored coverage and, you know, it, it's 71 percent rated as good or as, or as excellent. For those people who are underinsured, um, you know, it depends, I mean, what kind of coverage have they bought? If they're in the individual market, have they bought, um, you know, a short-term limited duration plan, which most young people are now buying, but the um, the Democrats want to get rid of them, but you have to, if you, a number of insurers today offer care to people, cancer care to people that, that can't afford the treatment, but they want to get the very best treatment, because the very best treatment for cancer care is in this country. I mean, if, if you look at all the new, the stem cells, the bone marrow transplants, those things happen here. They don't happen in, 
countries where the government is a big provider of health care. So uh, one of my colleagues' sister at age 45 was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Um, she didn't have insurance, but she signed up, and she couldn't sign up for Obamacare because she was a lawyer, but she didn't have a job. You can't get, you couldn't get individual coverage on the exchange if you didn't have a job, even though her family could afford to pay for her coverage. So she um, had stage four ovarian cancer, and then she had some tests, and she had stage four lung cancer. This was six years ago. Um, she is still a lot, they gave her two years at UCLA Harbor where most of the Medi-Cal patients, she was on Medi-Cal, are treated. They gave her two years to live. Fortunately, through some friends, she was able to get to City of Hope and she is still alive today. She's been all over the, she's been everywhere. And when, when, when you know, she, she, they would get a bill from an insurer, say you own, you owe this tremendous amount of money. But when you call the hospital, they have financial plans to help so many of those people. So she hasn't had to pay any of those bills. There's all kinds of programs out there to help those people who don't have the, the, um, the money perhaps to pay for that treatment because they don't have insured, have insurance. But there, there are all kinds of programs, what drug companies, um, um, health plans are offering. So we, th that is something I'm looking into though is the, the issue of medical bankruptcy because there is a lot of misconception about who are the people who actually went bankrupt because of their medical bills and not because of overspending on their credit cards or, um, or they're over buying a house that they can't afford the mortgage for. Hi, so you mentioned one of the uh, biggest problems with healthcare is people going to say uh, University of Chicago emergency room for basic treatment. And uh, along that point, don't you believe that there's simply just a disconnect between the incentive the patient has to, to seek a cost-effective uh, treatment and, and the provider to provide that? Because right. we have a third-party system, the doctor is practicing defensive medicine, as you mentioned, the insurer wants to raise the volume to increase the premium, and the uh, patient just wants, uh, without any cost uh, incentive, just wants whatever is available. Uh, and when you have the best healthcare system in the world ranked uh, constantly is Singapore, which removed, uh, which actually has uh, high deductible, but gives the uh, gives each person a, a good a, a portion of forced savings, in, incentivizes them with uh, forced right. savings, and with that, uh, their their tremendously reduced costs. I think their GDP was like five percent. Is that? something similar to what you would be proposing? Um, well, f first of all, let me say that, you know, we, we need to put doctors and patients in charge of our health care. You're right. Everyone is in a third party payer system, whether you have an insurance plan or you have a government plan. And so, but what, one of the ways that we're going to solve a lot of these problems is by bringing about price transparency, which we don't have in this country. When people know, like if I have a hernia and I go to um, um, so what, the city of hope here and say uh, call up and say well how much would the hernia operation be nobody can tell you I mean you can talk to 10 people we have no idea but there, we should be able to access what the cost is and that's one of the things that President Trump has been talking about is getting transparency so people can shop for you know different types of plans different types of procedures I might get an MRI at one place for two hundred dollars another place it's eight hundred dollars but I want to know you know what that is um, so price transparency is key to, to this issue. Uh, looking at Singapore, Singapore is a country of five million people. It's a very small population. The government is a major controller of how Singaporeans live their life. Under their health care plan, it has three parts. It has uh, the MediShare, the MediFund, and the Meta something else. The first one um, uh, has a health savings ac account component to it, but it's mandatory that you set up your HSA and pay for it. The next plant part is the um, uh, uh, um, insurance coverage. And it, it ranges between three to $5,000 a year. If you don't have an HSA and you don't have the insurance, then you go into the Meta, whatever the last one is, I can't think of the name, Meta something. Um, and that is the, gov the full government program. But the, the issue is in Singapore, the government determines how much you're gonna have to pay for your HSA, how much you're gonna have to pay for your insurance, and, and what the government portion is. So I don't think that's the way to go in America, but I do support opening up price transparency, health savings accounts, and all of these kinds of things that will bring about uh, competition. 
you know, we're a country of 330 million people. It's fine to talk about Switzerland, you know, with 14 million people or Singapore with 5 million, but those plans, you know, are not going to work for our very diverse uh, population and very large country. Thank you for uh, your talk today. I'm very empathetic to your point about um, physicians. My dad uh, is a cardiologist and actually retired in response to Obamacare um, because he wasn't going to be making nearly what he would have been making beforehand. Um, but I'm curious, uh, and I was surprised that you didn't speak about, uh, about medical school acceptance rates. And medical whether school what? acceptance rates and yep. whether or not increasing acceptance rates and maybe lowering the bar for American doctors um, would increase the amount of doctors that we have today um, and not significantly decrease the actual amount of care, uh, especially considering like how many technological advancements we've had um, in the past decade related to healthcare. Right. So. Um Medical school is, is expensive. A lot of kids come out with $200,000 in debt. It's hard to get into medical school. But f for the most part, as I said earlier, the best and brightest kids go into medicine. If the government takes over the healthcare system where they're going to be paid 40% below, we're going to see a reduction in the best and brightest going into medicine. There is no question that nurse practitioners, physicians assistants can do a lot of the procedures that doctors do and it's far cheaper to pay a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. A lot of docs don't want to give up, you know, doing the, giving you a vaccination or whatever, but we really need to open up the system so that there are different types of people can do different types of uh, procedures. You don't need to have a medical doctor do um, every, every type of uh, procedure. And I think there should be more medical colleges, but they're, they're very expensive. When they, you know, when you look, uh, Kaiser is opening their own medical school here in, um, in Pasadena. I think um, it looks like it's nearly finished. Um, docs who go there, they're tr the people they're going to admit to that Kaiser Hospital uh, for training uh, medical students um, is looking at diverse uh, backgrounds of, of, of students so that they can go into the community and treat people of diverse backgrounds. I don't, I mean, for me, I don't care who my doctor is, if it's a man, a woman, whatever, I just want to be able to get the best. And so I think it's worrying if you think about setting up a system where you're going to go to a medical school that, like at Kaiser where it's going to be free, but you are going to have to work for that system after you graduate to pay back the cost of your treatment. But will these people be the best and brightest? But I do think there could be, you know, there could be more, more medical schools, there could, but there's also the ability to have nurse practitioners and things that can do things that doctors don't have to do and actually would leave them more time to do the kind of medicine that they're trained for. They don't, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, we need to open, open up, up the system. When I go to medical schools and debate students, I was at USC Medical School a year and a half ago. There were about 300 medical students there. All of the people, the, the moderator and the two other docs on the panel with me were all single-payer advocates. So I was, as always, by my, on one side. All of the professors in the medical schools today are virtually single-payer um, proponents. They're paid by the hospital, um, and so th they teach single-payer health care. Students were snickering while I was talking, but they, when they get into the real world and find out what medicine is really like and how they're going to practice medicine, I think it will be an eye-opener for them. But if the government runs it, many of them will be disappointed. Some may want the government to, to run their plan. We now know that 46% of graduating medical specialists are now joining hospital groups. The, the whole idea of the single um, practice doctor or the small group practice, those are going the way of, the, of, the, of high button shoes because the, the young people don't want to you know, have to work long hours, fill in all this paperwork, do electronic health record work. So they're saying, I'd rather have a nine to five job, know what I'm going to be paid, and therefore it's really destroying the, the practice of, of private medicine, which has really made this country great. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm over here, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I've noticed you've kind of been reiterating about how if physicians are being paid, for example, 40% less, that they will not be the best and the brightest. Um, I don't understand how that's necessarily being connected because I feel like there are plenty of jobs where people might be being paid less, for example, nurse practitioners, and these are incredibly bright people. Um, my question on that, though, is about how 
I think if you're also considering, I think right now in this conversation we're talking about people who can afford the best insurance and how having private insurance is best because they will have less waiting times. But I think in the conversation, can you touch upon like federally qualified health centers, which is like people who don't have insurance, who probably have waiting times that are less than in Canada, or people who never go to the hospital at all, go to the emergency room because they've been waiting and they don't get care because of the fact that they don't think that they can pay it, and that actually costs hospitals and the government more, rather than if we had prevented this and had it more accessible. So, right. yeah, well, can, can we talk about that aspect of it? Uh, yeah, emergency room care, uncompensated care, is the most expensive. But, you know, we pay, we, people who have private insurance subsidize those people who turn up at hospitals for the care that they don't, they, they don't pay for. So that uncompensated care, there's a big cost to, because, it ha you know, it has to be, it has to be paid. I mean, I talked about retail clinics, community hospitals. As I say, nobody can be turned away from an emergency room. But many of the people with, with certain conditions, they're not too serious, should, can turn up at a community hospital. That's what community hospitals were built uh, for. And, th and they're a great, they're a great um, alternative. But in Canada, you know, the, the hospitals, the, the radiologists, the head of the radiologist um, um, association in Canada said that the radiology machines in the hospitals in Canada are so old and outdated because the government can't afford to replace with the latest equipment that they oftentimes can't rely on the, on the um, results that they get from their, their, their equipment. So, you know, we want to have a vibrant market for medical device, you know, for um, drugs, for uh, uh, other kinds of treatments and different types of, of, of plans. That's what makes America great. Nancy Pelosi, you know, said, you know, that the short-term limited duration plans that came into being, Obama cut the short-term limited duration plans that don't have essential health benefits on them from, um, from a year down to three months. President Trump introduced short-term limited duration plans that are good for a year and you can renew them for three years and there are no benefits so the average premium is low. These are not for everybody but for young people, people like you, you're probably healthy, you're not going to get a major issue and so um, so th these are, th we need lots of alternatives for people who are at different points um, in, in, in their lives. So you know it's, you know healthcare is not a right but we, we do want to America to have the very best healthcare and as I say, 71% of people rate the health care that they have uh, in the employer market as, as, as good or as excellent. Thank you for your talk. Um, you talked a little bit about competition, right, and opening competition in the health care market. And then you talked about uh, making sure that prices could be clearer. And I think obviously those points tie in a lot together. If you have clear prices, you know, it's really easy for there to be um, better competition, right? Yeah. Um, but I want to know how you think we can get a clarity in prices, because you didn't really touch on that as much. So could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah. Um, so um, President Trump introduced a rule, a proposed rule, on creating transparency in prices, which doctors and hospitals and insurers would have to post their prices. And so there's no reason why they can't. We can price anything in this country, and there's no reason why this can't happen. You know, there's always going to be people that, that you know, don't want to do this. But I think it's coming, and I think it has to come if we're going to get control over our health spending in this, in this country. This will be our last question. Well, speaking of President Trump, um, he hasn't really introduced a health care plan for 2020, but the House Republican, um, a group of House Republicans released a 58-page part one of their health care plan, which in essence um, repeals and replaces Obamacare by letting all 50 states create their own plans. Um, what is your opinion on that, considering that this might lead to some states taking a single-payer approach, some states potentially taking your approach, right. and a bit of a disjointed approach between all 50 states? Right, right. Um, well, I do believe that President Trump was elected president in 2016 when he went to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania and said, we are going to repeal and replace disastrous Obamacare and people have had so many problems um, with Obamacare, high premiums, high deductibles that people, middle income people can't afford, um, short, um, um, small networks of doctors and hospitals, but people, less than, fewer than what people had before. And so the Republicans had that mandate in 2016 with the House, the Senate and the presidency 
And unfortunately, like cats in a laundry bag, they couldn't agree on, on a plan that would be a repeal and replacement of plan. And um, Dr. Tom Price, um, uh, doc, orthopedic surgeon from Atlanta, and I had developed a plan, which is so, somewhat of what I've talked about. But they just, John McCain, while he was ill, he came in at the last moment and says, well, thumbs down on that. So consequently, um, the Republicans um, didn't push their plan forward, and they still, I mean, today, Trump said that he's going to have a, a replacement plan. I've been waiting for this replacement plan to see what it is, you know, for over a year. And I think the Democrats won the House in 2018 because the Republicans couldn't articulate what I articulated about how to deal with people with pre-existing conditions. You can't, you have to, you know, provide uh, coverage for them. Here in California, I do believe in block granting. Here in California, uh, Governor Newsom, who is a big supporter of single payer, he just announced in December his uh, Healthy California for All Commission uh, it had their first hearing on January 27th, a uh, preliminary report expected in July 2020, a final report in February 2021. The idea is to look at how to make single payer uh, in the state of California work. The 13 people that are on the panel, not one of them is someone who has views like myself. Richard Scheffler at Berkeley, who I debated and defeated in a debate in, in, at Berkeley in November, is on the commission, but I haven't been invited to be on it. But they're looking really just at how do you get single payer and how are you going to pay for it. If you look at the, the plan in, uh, from 2017 from Senators uh, Ricardo Lara, that plan, even Anthony Rendon, the House the assembly leader wouldn't, as a Democrat, wouldn't bring it to a vote because it was going to cost $400 billion a year for single payer, more than double the entire budget of the state of California. But Newsom is in a hard place because he was elected with a lot of support from the nurses union and from the SEIU, and he said he would bring about single payer. So he has this um, commission, but I am very skeptical because it will be so expensive. But already in California now, he increased the age of illegal immigrants being able to get Medi-Cal from age 19 to 26, at a, saying they'll get 90,000 people covered at a cost of $98 million. The Assembly actually wanted everyone illegal to be covered at a cost of $3.4 billion. I worry that illegals might come from other states thinking they can get free health care here. The individual mandate that left the federal uh, law, Obamacare, was reintroduced on January 1st of this year in California. Uh, $695 or, um, or a maximum of $2,085 or 2.5% 2 of income, whichever is greater, if you, don't, if you don't have coverage. And increasing that subsidy, subsidy level from the 400% of federal poverty, which is at the federal level under Obamacare, to 600%. So he's slowly doing things to move California um, into getting everyone covered and moving to a single payer system which is very worrying for me. But the Republicans are, are at fault. They did not come up with a plan which they should have. There were a lot of good ideas out there. And I'll see if Mr. Trump says he's going to have a plan before the election or will he say that as it gets closer, well, no, it'll be after I'm reelected. But right now, I think it was a mistake that they didn't. They were afraid that if they brought out a plan that people would be against it. But it's better to have something rather than nothing to run on. Thank you. Unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have tonight for questions. Please join me in thanking Sally Pipes for her talk tonight. Thank you.